Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is something that I've been working on for the past few years, and that is reconstructing the techniques of an extinct Irish folk wrestling tradition. Uh, before I start talking about the how, I just want to briefly have a look at the what. So this is the folk wrestling tradition in question. Uh, it was called Collar and Elbow. It was a type of jacket wrestling from Ireland. So that's wrestling in which both participants would be wearing jackets. Practiced mainly in the 19th century. It was a fixed hold style of wrestling, meaning that you had predetermined grips that you had to take. In this case, right hand on your opponent's collar, left hand on the sleeve. Now, since your upper body was largely taken out of the equation, it was very leg centric. So there was lots of sweeps, lots of trips, lots of foot blocks. And in some places in Ireland, even you were actively allowed to kick. The most traditional way to win was by what was called the fair backfall. So if you have ever studied judo, you would know it as an ippon, basically flat and definitive back contact against the ground after a throw or a trip. As a style, it was incredibly popular both in Ireland and abroad. Wherever Irish immigrants went, so the US and the UK in particular, but also to places like Australia and New Zealand. It was phenomenally popular in the 19th century, but then around about the end of the 19th century and especially the opening decades of the 20th century, it started rapidly declining. And by the time we start getting to the 1910s, 1920s, it had essentially disappeared entirely. So the barriers to reconstructing a style like that. Number one, there are no living practitioners whatsoever. So as I said, by the time you get to the early 20th century, you start seeing statements like this very frequently. Journalists referring to the sport as a lost art or the ancient days when collar and elbow was the rule. Fast forward a hundred years again to the modern day, there is no one left alive who has ever actually actively participated in this sport. So we have no one we can talk to to ask, how was it actually done? Another barrier, there are no technique manuals. And that is in spite of the fact that we have manuals or let's say visual depictions of wrestling technique going back as far as 2000 BC. So these are drawings from a wall in Egypt that depict very recognizable modern wrestling techniques. Up through the medieval period into the early modern period, we see manuals, you know, sometimes things like this, sometimes literal manuals for a huge range of wrestling styles across Europe and the world. But collar and elbow, not a single one. There are some visual depictions offered. So there are some photos and there are some illustrations, but they are static. They are things like this. Photographs and illustrations depicting two wrestlers in their collar and elbow pose. So they are useful in the sense that they do show us roughly what people were wearing and that it was right hand on collar, left hand on sleeve, but we don't have any visual depictions of movement and of technique. So the actual motion and movement of the style are essentially lost in that regard. They have not been committed to the visual record. So that is something that I wanted to try and change. Now, how do we do that? I often compare wrestling to language in the sense that it is something that has arisen everywhere. You have any group of people at any point in history, they have figured out how to communicate with each other. And they, at some point they have probably figured out how to grab each other and throw each other to the ground. Now, if you were trying to reconstruct a dead language with no speakers and no manuals, you would find that quite difficult. When it comes to wrestling, things are a bit easier because no matter what culture you look at, no matter what part of the world, no matter what language they speak or religion they adhere to or what period of time we're talking about, the laws of physics and the human body do not change. We are tall bipedal primates. We stand bolt upright on two feet. We have, at least on average, two arms and two legs and a relatively high center of mass, round about here, roughly at the level of the navel. If you want to knock one of us off balance, it's quite easy to do. You just have to tilt us forward or backwards or left or right far enough that our center of mass is no longer over our feet and we fall. When you look at the various different grappling styles, 
that have arisen throughout human history. They have figured out the most efficient and the most effective way to do this over and over and over again. Like I said, the human body and the laws of physics do not change. So when you look at all these wrestling styles, you start seeing the same movements and mechanics that have risen to the top via convergent evolution. So for example, pulling your opponent's upper body, their center of mass forward, and then blocking their foot so that they can't step forward and catch their balance. So again, if you have ever studied judo, you would know this move, this mechanic, as Sasai Tsul Komiyashi. But elsewhere in the world, it is called, for example, a Fußstich in Switzerland, or a Legerbracht in Iceland, or a Trippet in Norfolk in the United Kingdom. No matter where you go, if groups of people have engaged in competitive grappling and tried to throw each other to the ground, at some point, you will see this mechanic arise. Pull the upper body, block the foot, pull the upper body, block the foot. Clothing differs, geography differs, the rules differ in terms of maybe what parts of the body you're allowed to grip or what type of clothing you're allowed to wear, but the mechanic is the same. Pull the upper body, block the foot, pull the upper body, block the foot. So we have essentially a lexicon of common grappling mechanics that have been used across cultures and throughout history. You see things like an inside trip, an outside trip, an inner thigh reap, an outer reap, a rising knee lift, a hip throw, and these are just examples of the mechanics that pop up over and over and over again. Physical mechanics that manifest themselves in techniques of individual grappling styles. So which of these mechanics were used in collar and elbow. And here's where we start looking for our building blocks. This is a quotation from an American newspaper just at the end of the 19th century. William Johnston, the clever collar and elbow wrestler, once demonstrated to bare knuckle boxing champion John L. Sullivan what a wonderful game he is the master of. And here we see reference to a technique called a back heel. And here we're quite lucky because there is actually a technique with that exact same name in the neighboring wrestling style of Scotland called backhold. And here in the photograph, you see the Scottish backhold, back heel in action. So mechanically, you are pushing your opponent's upper body, their center of mass backwards, and you are blocking their lower body so that they are unable to step back and catch their center of mass underneath them. In collar and elbow, it wouldn't have been able to work exactly like this because as you'll remember from the introduction in collar and elbow you have to keep your fixed grips on the front of your opponent's jacket so this particular upper body configuration would not have worked but mechanically it would have worked and with a little bit of hands-on experimentation we can confirm that those mechanics are perfectly applicable with the collar and elbow grips that practitioners of the style would have had to use so the collar and elbow version of the back heel starts to emerge. Another example, again, another quotation here from an American newspaper detailing a championship collar and elbow match at the end of the 19th century. Dufour's right foot shot out, pinning Owen's left foot down and bringing the full force of his massive shoulders to bear. We've already seen this. Pulling the upper body forward, blocking with the lower body. Pull the upper body forward, block with the low, pull and block. Now again, in collar and elbow, this exact configuration would not have worked. You wouldn't have been allowed to take this grip or this grip or this grip. But again, a little bit of hands-on experimentation, right hand on the collar, left hand on the sleeve, and we confirm that that mechanic works perfectly as indeed we had seen in that newspaper quote from the 19th century championship match. And third and final example for today at least, Dufour, now exercising his marvelous strength and celerity, shot his powerful right leg under Owens and with a trip and a twitch laid his man. This is a mechanic that we can see in other grappling styles as well. So this is Judo's Taiotoshi and a similar move from Chinese wrestling called Shuaijiao. And once again, bit of hands-on experimentation, right hand on the collar, left hand on the sleeve of a durable grappling jacket, 
and we can confirm that that collar and elbow version of the move called the cross ankle trip would have worked very well. And now we have it committed to the visual record. Now this is another quite meaningful aspect of the whole reconstruction process. This is a dictionary of sporting terms that was published by the Irish Department of Education in the year 1900. So it has chapters on things like track and field, on ball sports like football and rugby, and it has a chapter here on wrestling and boxing. So it gives the English word for these wrestling specific terms and then gives their Irish equivalent. And this is very important because Ireland in the 19th century, when collar and elbow was at its height, had already quite noticeably begun its transition towards becoming a majority Anglophone country. So when we are looking at all these old accounts of wrestling matches and the technique names that were used to describe the various movements, they are all in English. I would say 99% of them in English. So the Irish is lost along the way. Each village probably had its own specific way of describing techniques and movements, but those haven't been committed to the historical record. And unfortunately, there might not be any way to ever really retrieve that level of colloquial Irish wrestling vocabulary. But what is at least preserved is this. And in this dictionary, we can see that the Irish language, as the 19th century moves into the 20th century, had quite a diverse and highly descriptive vocabulary for dealing with wrestling and wrestling movements including the movements and the techniques of collar and elbow. Now, the chapter, as I mentioned, does deal with boxing and wrestling as a whole, including some of the other popular wrestling styles of the day, like Catches Catch Can and Greco-Roman. So not all of these would have worked for collar and elbow. They either wouldn't have been allowed under the rule set, or they simply wouldn't have been possible because your hands would have been fixed in place on the front of your opponent's jacket. So we do have to do a little bit of trimming here. And once that trimming is done, we're still left with quite a comprehensive list of throws and grips and movements that very much would have been possible in collar and elbow. So as we continue putting our building blocks together, pulling those old newspaper quotes, conducting hands-on experimentation to confirm that they would have worked under collar and elbow's unique rule set. What we can now add to those are the Irish names for each technique, which is quite a meaningful achievement when it comes to preserving this old aspect of Irish wrestling heritage. So this is just an example of some of the techniques that we've reconstructed so far, and there will be more to come.